Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, the well of being. Um, yeah, really nice to be here with you all. I think tonight we will do a little bit different, but somewhat similar to last week. Um, so I, didn't, I think we're going to start with just a couple moments together of grounding and really arriving. And then I want to unpack a practice for us, which is a benefactor practice. Maybe some of you have done benefactor practice here before or in general. Um, it is somewhat related to the chapters that we are in here in Old Path White Clouds. Um, it just struck me. It's pretty interesting that, you know, the Buddha and his Sangha, which is <clears throat> ever growing from you know, it started with his five friends and quickly became 900 people three months later and continues to grow. They exist entirely on the generosity of benefactors, um, individuals and large. And I really, I like the idea of considering the support that we already have as a way to help us extend support to others. <clears throat> so we'll start with a little grounding practice talk a bit about benefactors and do a benefactor practice and then dig in. So for those, for those who maybe um, haven't been here for a while or it's your first time, we are winding our way through Old Path White Clouds, with it, which is a beautiful book by Thich Nhat Hanh um, on the historical life of the Buddha. We are almost halfway through and it's a beautiful storytelling arc in that the same teachings come up over and over, but as the same teachings come up over and over, I may not completely revisit them every single time. So we'll kind of do a little bit of a, a high level on each of these. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started by just giving ourselves a moment to settle in. This will be only about a five minute practice. So finding whatever posture feels like it can support you. Having a sense of ground. You think of this practice as a transition and in between. For most of us coming from another part of our day or life into this beautiful opportunity to be in sacred space together. And so to feel and embody that transition, invite the sense of dignity and uprightness through our posture. And this is also an invitation to transition to a time in which we get to really deeply care for ourselves. A sense of ease, relaxation, maybe getting to slightly lower the guard or the shield. So invite a softening to the face and the chest and the belly. And for the next couple of breaths, really feel a sense of the entire body as it's breathing in, and the entire body as it's breathing out. And just notice the subtle settling of the body as we pour our attention and awareness into the experience of this unified field of the body, breathing in and breathing out.
Maybe you notice there's some thoughts or feelings, maybe some to-do lists that are capturing your attention. No problem. Just making more space. Feeling as though the breath can really cleanse whatever is in the way of fully inhabiting our body. From the sense of dwelling in the present moment. Considering the possibility that fully harnessing our attention and awareness to the breath could be the most important thing we are doing, not only in this moment, but in this day, maybe even in this lifetime. With that level of commitment and engagement, let's continue following the breath and the whole body for just a bit longer. Let's finish this initial settling in by breathing together in harmony. And we'll slow our breath for this process. So giving yourself a moment to finish your last exhale. And then together, slowly inhaling. And together, slowly exhaling. Inhaling and lengthening the breath. And exhale, extending. One last time together, inhaling slowly. And exhaling. <clears throat> That's better. All right. Welcome back. And um, yeah, I think there's many familiar faces in the room, but also some folks um, maybe who haven't been here or haven't been here as much. So just to welcome you to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, which is an entirely volunteer run space. Um, it's really beautiful to commit to community and doing these teachings together. In the Dharma Collective, there's a real focus and value and goal that we are learning these teachings for the sake of all beings. So helping ourselves become slightly less caught up in our own neuroses and habitual patterns so that we can really fully show up for each other. And we start that practice here with each other. So part of our practice is going to be meditation, but also discussion. And when we are discussing, the invitation is to really listen compassionately. Listen from a place of being anchored in your own experience and considering with empathy 
whatever you might be hearing, considering with this kind of beginner's mind of not knowing what someone else's life experience is and allowing them to say what they say. And this incredible practice, which is so hard of really being aware of our judgment. I'm not going to tell you to withhold all your judgment because that would be incredibly hard, but be aware of and practice, you know, kind of noticing when judgment arises and, and the same for our speech with one another. If we were saying something and kind of feel like, man, that went a little off the rails or we have a little vulnerability hangover, like I shared too much, being compassionate with yourself. Right. So using this space as a training ground for the compassionate communication and engagement we want to see in the world. It's really important to us here at the Dharma Collective that we try to create and facilitate a space where that's possible and always invite folks to reach out to us and let us know um, if there's more that we can do to make that possible. So the practice I want to introduce us to this benefactor practice. Has anyone here worked or listened to um, any teachings by John McCransky before Lama John? He's a Tibetan Lama uh, based in Boston, and his primary teacher is um, Sokni Rinpoche, who I talk about literally all the time. And uh, John McCransky you know, in working deeply with Sokni has kind of gleaned a couple of practices I, I think are so beautiful. Um, John McCransky worked very closely with uh, Brooke Lavelle Dodson, who some of you may know for her work, uh, Courage to Care, bringing a lot of compassion practices into social justice movement and dialogue. And this practice, the benefactor practice, it's such a simple and beautiful practice. I've, I've heard the version of Sokni as well. And it can be challenging for folks. It, it has a little bit of a flavor of uh, a compassion practice or loving kindness practice when we bring to mind someone and we want to, you know, either in the case of loving kindness and compassion, we want to extend that quality to them. And for some of us, it's hard to choose people, right? We think of someone that we want to imagine with compassion and yet we remember when they were cruel or unkind, or maybe they were just checked out and busy. And we can get a little caught up in this idea of the specificity of the person. And with the benefactor practice, it's the same. We are working to bring to mind people who have made us feel loved, made us feel cared for. Usually those are complex relationships. They change over time, right? And sometimes with the benefactor practice, it's like, go back to your early life. It's like, cool, let's get even more complicated, right? Because even if we were fortunate enough to have a good early relationship with our parents, inevitably that changes and shifts over time. So what's important about the benefactor practice is not remembering you know, a flawless human, but remembering like the best qualities of that human and how it made you feel. And what I love Lama John says about this, um, I get his words right. Yeah, it's just beautiful. He says, in the benefactor practice, we're connecting with a field of love, with the field of love, that we're always in, in order to be an extension of that love in the world. So connecting with the field of love that we are always in, in order to be an extension of that love in the world. So this idea that, you know, um, I hope we're on the same page here. We're here for the liberation of all beings. Raise your hand if that's true, right? That includes like loving all beings. That's hard. Right. That, that can be hard. And, you know, we can do it um, out of sheer effort and will. We can do it when things are really good, like we've had enough rest and got some good food. And for a couple moments, it seems like the world's a nice place. And then it's like, oh, so much compassion. Right. But I think what this practice helps us is it's really calling it. And it's in some ways a way of thinking about these practices that are a bit more um you know, traditional or formal of calling in the gurus um, that can resonate for you. You might already have a sense of like, oh, I want to call in the gurus and the benefactors offers us this different way of um, not having it necessarily be these beings who are um, 
timeless and formless, like deities and teachers who are no longer with us, but people in our own life who have shown us kindness and letting ourselves really resonate in that field as a way to potentiate our capacity to be with others. Another interesting aspect of the benefactor practice I have found, and it reminds me of the feeding your demons practice that some of us did together this weekend. When we are attending to our emotional inner emotional needs, right? Getting kind of fed, nourished, our ability to rest in unconfigured awareness increases. So for those, we just did this little practice of centering with our breath who experienced in that short amount of time, some difficult emotions that arose at any point. Yeah. How about difficult thoughts, feelings? Yeah. Okay. We can, we can cop to thoughts easier than emotions. I get it. Um, right. So these like things come up and part of that is like being able to settle into our practice. We create or ideally can create a sense of, I know Tig spoke with you about this a couple of weeks back, our inner refuge, our sense that like, it's safe and we're okay. If it's safe and we're okay, those like thoughts, memories, emotions, they kind of like settle down a little bit, you know, they're like attended to. So my, my hope or invitation with this benefactor practice is it, It's beautiful. It's an enriching way to give ourselves that kind of warm compassion that we are always already in and also give ourselves that sense of creating inner refuge so we can touch that sense of unconfigured awareness. (laughs) Unconfigured awareness is a, a, a term that even for the even for folks who have been practicing a long time can be very vague. Even open awareness is actually quite vague, right? We want to directly experience it. That's of course the best way, but just a little bit of description of, you know, maybe what's absent when we're in that space where we're settled enough. Where it's absent is a feeling of needing to monitor or modify or control our experience in an unconfigured awareness we're not really you know preoccupied with not only the future and the past but even whether it's a good thought or a bad thought that's coming through it's not that there's no thoughts that could happen that'd be great but it's a sense of really like loosening around or this kind of um I'd say like very front of the windscreen level of what's happening in our consciousness, this idea of unconfigured, or you could say primordial awareness is the spaciousness, our natural state of mind. That can be really hard to believe, right? We think our natural state of mind is like rumination, despair, excitement, but that there is this natural state of mind, which is described as luminous and clear. I mean, it's really a beautiful experience to have, even just a little bit of it. It gives us that sense that there is a, an inner freedom or an inner sense of refuge. And I think almost all or many meditation practices invite us to find our way there. Um, so before we do the benefactor practice, be curious from folks, when you think about this word benefactor, Like who or what comes up? It's helpful to think a little ahead of time because sometimes it can be challenging. Anyone think of a benefactor, someone who has been kind to us, someone who has showed up in a way that made us feel cared about or loved even briefly. This could be a memory that's long ago or a memory more recent. I think I see a hand, a Diane there. Yes. Okay, now can I make Thank you so much. You know, I think of the people that hired me because Mm. there's been junctures in my life where I just think, wow, if that person hadn't hired me then, they're the Mm. easiest to think of because that's such a big deal. You know, I've had a long career with high tech companies and really you're like a polar bear on a melting ice floe. So you kind of have to go to the right department in the right place and 
And it, it's mm. so dire now if you don't have employment, especially where I live in San Jose. So I think of them. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Anybody else? Benefactor? Anyone or anything come up? Yeah. Well, I was thinking about mentors. Mentors. And, yes. Uh, how sometimes people that you expect to be your mentors turn out to be your tormentors <laughs> and the people who you did not expect to be yeah. generous are actually uh, your greatest resources. That's beautiful. I'll, I'll repeat that for folks, which is sometimes who you expect to be your mentors turn out to be your tormentors. And then people you least expect might show up and, you know, in the benefactor practice, absolutely. If there's been a teacher, someone who's been like a Dharma door for us, um, they can really come to mind. Um, I've mentioned before, but um, folks in this room may know this teacher, um, but I was very fortunate. I went to high school with someone who was a real Dharma door for me. Um, Chris McKenna, some of you know, as a teacher and he really, um, yeah, opened me up to meditation and Buddhism very early. And I, I was like, that's hippie shit, honestly. Sorry. That was my real first reaction. It took me years to really understand like what he was talking about and like understand how it could transform my life. But I think of, you know, those people who open up, like Diane said, giving us work so foundational, helping us see the Dharma or our practice. Amazing. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other folks come up yeah oh, just it's, it's a long list i've got a lot of, of things coming up and thinking and i've seen faces and then i'm thinking of yeah people that i've worked for and you know, that i'm self-employed i've read that think of that mm. think about um, teachers i think about my um you know some, sometimes authors people have read yeah and and my heritage and thank you yeah 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 i think it's um i think all great examples and our hope is to really come up with like a field like a huge group so widening that to people we've read um yeah any others just so we get kind of you're not spending your practice thinking like is there anyone right yeah jimmy if you can if you, you hear know. me in Zoom lab? Yeah, they can. Okay. Um, whenever this comes up, I, it, it's immediate to me, and it's Lou and Seal Kitterman, hmm. who were an older couple who lived next door to us when I was growing up. And they were the closest thing to grandparents that I had. And they loved me and all of us kids. Period. We didn't have to be be doing well in school. We didn't mm. have to be well behaved. I didn't have to be a good boy. I didn't, you know, I, they, they just were so generous in their time and affection and regard mm. that, and it was it's, it's they were unlike any relationship I've had before or during or since hmm. they were just yeah just wonderful wonderful people and, and wonderful to, to to all of us kids when i yeah up. Hmm. beautiful yeah thanks for bringing them here and i think it is interesting you know in our young life it's possible that we have these experiences of receiving care and we don't quite even know yet that that's unusual hmm. you know that just getting someone's like warm smile or um you know someone who cares about us in a different way um and i think it's interesting <clears throat> bringing back to old path white clouds is you know everyone who wants to study closely with the buddha and become a monastic they have to let go of everything they own and you know many if not the majority especially in the first couple of years who join the buddha are like very wealthy beings like like princes and the sons of merchants and they let everything go and then they have to completely exist on what's offered 
And I, I don't think that's just an efficient business model, like, ah, no overhead, right? I think um, I think that it's like purposeful, right? Like you require other people's generosity to live. Like if that's not a teaching on interdependence, like what is? Um, okay, we juiced up for benefactor practice? All right, okay, so let's find a Posture once again, if you want to like get up and stretch for a moment. Stay in the air. Oh. Turn the heat on. You're my benefactor. It's nice in here now. Let's come right back to settling into the body a bit more. Noticing and attending to the tactile sensations throughout the body. Connecting to this sense of stillness, stability, Really allowing our center of gravity to drop from our head and the mind and the thinking realm. And become evenly distributed throughout our whole body. Feeling the natural aliveness in the body. And if there's areas that feel stuck or tight, whether with physical tension or pain, or maybe some emotional blockage, make it not a problem. Just keep breathing and as though you were combing through your body with your attention and awareness. Just allowing attention and awareness to be experienced throughout the entire body. And settling the mind, inviting a quality of spaciousness, openness. 
<laughs> throughout the entire body. So building from that sense of stillness to the sense of openness. And whatever thoughts and memories or images arise, again, not a problem. Just relaxing and releasing and returning to the sense of being in this body, experiencing, connecting to stillness, inviting this quality of spacious, open mind. And then settling our speech, our inner narration, by inviting a quality of silence. It can help us to follow the breath closely, noticing subtle sensations like the sensations coming in and out of the nostrils or at the belly, tethering our mind this way to the small area of focus can help us with that silencing of our inner speech. Just a couple more breaths here. Remembering every time our attention gets captured, it's just not a problem. Just keep returning and finding stillness and the openness and the silence. I'm taking a moment here with a little bit more of presence and stability. Consider an intention for being here together this evening. 
seeing if this intention can come not from the thinking mind, some deeper knowing. Maybe it's a word, maybe it's just a feeling. Allowing the intention to really fill the space like a lantern illuminating a dark room. And then allowing the intention to just gently recede into the background, not disappearing, but not being in the forefront. And bringing our attention and awareness to wherever we are meeting the earth. Maybe it's our feet <laughs> touching the ground. Maybe our seat. And allowing ourselves to feel the support. Imagining that the earth is our benefactor. We've never had to think about it, but there it is for us. Rising up to meet us, holding us as we sit or lie or stand or dance. Being steady and stable, whether we're happy, sad, and angry. Feeling or imagining not just a sense of being upon the earth, but the earth really rising up to meet us. So feeling the ground around us as a stable basis of support, not just a neutral platform, but supportive, loving, unconditional. And then shifting our attention and awareness to bring to mind a benefactor. Someone who has showed us kindness or inspiration. Someone who we felt a sense of being cared for. Again, this doesn't have to be a perfect person. This can be someone who at times has been difficult but at times has really helped us feel secure, safe, inspired. And start by bringing just one person to mind. And you can imagine them either beside you or behind you or in front of you. The important thing is to feel a sense of their care radiating towards you.
and let their imagined presence here and help reveal that love that is inside of you. Maybe you see them smiling. Maybe that smile comes to you on the face or in the heart, in the belly. And extending, expanding, inviting in another benefactor, another being who showed up with care and support. And bringing them into the constellation around you. And feeling the aliveness of that support here and now. And we'll keep going. Let's invite another being. Again, imagining them here, maybe starting to form a semicircle around you or behind you. And this could be someone recently or someone a long time ago. A moment of kindness. <laughs> Maybe something you'd even forgotten until this moment. And let's invite one more. Another being who has showed up at some time in our life with care. It's okay if it's hard to visualize exactly each person. It's the feeling that really matters, having a sense of this love and care encircling you. It could even be seen as just a, a crescent of light in front of you or feeling that behind you. And again, really feeling that this love of this being, this care, this kindness, it's already here. It's been inside of you. Just really letting it shine and radiate, feel its presence within you here and now. We could feel or imagine a sense of light throughout our entire body. All the little areas where love has touched us over the years. As though love was within each and every cell. In our bones. And in the tissues.
Just a couple more breaths here, feeling this constellation of beings radiating what's already within us, a sense of love and connection. Whether or not we feel as though we've done it on our own or we have to do it on our own, just letting in this realization that within us, we are made up of all the many instances of love and kindness and care we have received. And then shifting away from this imagining and visualizing. Feeling as though we could rest in a more spacious sense of awareness. An awareness that is infused with loving presence. Keeping a light focus on the breath. And letting the mind and awareness expand and extend all around us. Reconnecting to the body, a sense of being in this next breath, dwelling in this present moment. A sense of being in this shared space together. And feeling the benefactor is still here with us. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for your benefactors. I felt like 
there was more than just mine in the room. I think I could feel yours too. Yeah, I would love to hear from folks any um, reflections or questions about that practice. Yes, please. And do you mind using, you can drag the mic over to you, Ethan. Yeah. There we go. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. There we go. Uh, I don't think that was supposed to be as rough as it was for me. And maybe it's my dyslexia kicking in. But I started out with, the people that have actually taught me the most about myself and have actually, uh, I have deepened my practice through are not the people who were kind. It was the people who were selfish and who bullied me. And so I said, nope, that is not what this is supposed to be about. And then I was able to go into who were the people who were who were kind. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's um, great redirection and also clear seeing. Right. Like that is um, turn all adversity into the path. Right. The lojong of recognizing what we've learned from. Uh, but that's great that you were able to shift it because that is it's a, it's a harder practice, a different kind of practice. We might not invite the whole crew. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else? Yes, please. Um, yeah, I, I found it to be very much so a gratitude exercise. Mm. Um, and then it was interesting. I kind of invited all these people in my life that are very supportive. And I kind of, as they came in, each one would say, yeah, you got it. Go raise it. Um, and at one point I felt a lot of emotion and kind of a release because hmm. it felt like a, I'm in a safe space, obviously, but then a safe space within a safe space. Yeah. Um, which was quite nice. Sweet. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. How was the last part of that um, kind of leaning back a little into awareness after having that sense of safety or release? Um, I think at this point in my life, I'm living very much so in the moments mm. and that was a nice moment. And coming back to reality was not as nice of a moment, mm -hmm. but that's just kind of where I'm at. Yeah. But obviously I have a, a delicious feeling. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anybody else? Objections, questions. Is this a practice you would call on again or use again? Yeah, please. It's interesting for me, I have people show up, like strangers that show up when you're like, something bad really don't happen and someone says, don't go down that way. Or yeah. For me, was, uh, when I was younger, I used to travel a lot, you know, there would be someone telling me, hey, don't walk down that street. Mm -hmm. Later on, I heard something. I mean, that was wild, you know. Yeah. That person. It's just people that, you know, you just briefly come to contact with. And yep. And you're significant in your life. And you're significant. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, the Did folks at home hear? No? Yes. So the folks that we don't, yeah, we don't necessarily realize or recognize, like little things. It actually makes me think um, when I take my dad out to dinner, he's quite elderly and um, really, can barely walk and move. And when folks, you know, who are working in the restaurant, like show a little kindness to him and to us, because the like, restaurants are definitely not made for babies or elders. It's like not what they're made for. Um, and it like totally moves me. Like it's so beautiful and simple. Just that little, that little act of, you know, holding the door open or something like that. Yeah. And it's, um, I meant to say with, with the gratitude aspect, um, I've been in a really good debate with some of my practitioner friends and um, and science friends because there's just like been so much invested in the research on gratitude 
and the benefits are so clear and you only need to do like a little bit and it really helps your well-being right but gratitude is not talked about very much in traditional buddhist teachings right and why and i think often at least in the contemporary psychological way that we generally do things it becomes very self-focused right um, whereas the benefactor, it's us, but we're recognizing our reliance upon others. And gratitude practice, actually, when you read even the contemporary scientific researchers who write about it, they say like a really good um, outcome or one of the kind of features of gratitude is recognizing like humility and indebtedness to others. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that way that our gratitude makes us feel like more focused on herself. Um, but it's an interesting kind of um, flavor or aspect of how do we bring in appreciation and like that deep sense of, um, yeah, I like care for other beings who care for us. So any other thoughts or questions before we shift a little towards our friend Buddha making his way? Yeah, please. Oh, I, I, I usually try to refrain from speaking twice at a meeting. This is kind of big. I felt like that. That was that was beautiful. Um, likewise, I the immediate um, feeling was gratitude mm -hmm. um, um, when asked to uh, call up an intention. That's 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 what came. Mm. It was obvious. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of the my four benefactors. It was beautiful. Um, I had so many to choose from, and, and I picked some good ones. But the end part, um, when we let go of the the benefactors and and, and got into our body, and 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 and, and you you said something uh, about letting that spread out somehow. I I felt this whole room. I felt you know everybody in this room everybody in this saga and then and then i visualize them and i have the opposite of like a photographic memory <laughs> but i could see you all mm -hmm. eyes closed I, mm -hmm. I i i i called you know all your names and faces mm -hmm. you know came to and uh, you know it was beautiful mm, thank you i'm so glad you spoke twice and i do appreciate your step back step forward orientation of letting there be space in the room, but yeah, that's lovely. And it is so interesting. Again, these levels of consciousness or awareness that we can tap into when we feel at ease, relaxed, safe, when that kind of identity project isn't running the show, you know, usually like a lot of our, you know, energy, I think it's terrible to think of, um, a web browser as our mind or consciousness, but bear with me. Um, you know, you have like that one tab open and it's like, you know, surf line, which Jimmy knows, and it takes a lot of energy. That's just like really the thing that's going and our identity project is off. It's like pulling so much energy of like, who am I? Who is that? Are they better than me? Are they worse than me? Am I above them? I below. It's like that settles. There's a lot else going on, like just a lot else happening and different ways of experiencing consciousness, being able to see everyone in the room or feel. Um, some folks might have this experience too, where often that to me is uh, kind of a, like a dissolving of a sense of a body. And like, I know I have a body, but it just is less like structured and solid here. And my teacher calls that like a confirming sign. Like, you know, you're able to maybe dip into some sense of more spacious awareness when these certain aspects of consciousness arise for us. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And we're travelers on the path here together. So like hearing someone else like, Oh yeah, I love that. It's really helpful. Yeah. I see a hand. Is that Claudia in the darkness? Yeah. <laughs> I I have a question, Eve. Can you hear me? I sure can. Yeah. Okay. Let me turn on the light because I'm in the. <laughs> okay. Um, you kind of touched on on what I was going to ask you. That you said that this practice also benefits us, and 
in addition to, uh, well, first of all, I want to say that um, visualizing my my benefactors, I, I felt a lot of joy. So, mm. you know, and of course, gratitude. But uh, I guess my question is, um, when you're talking about how it, it benefits us as well, um, you know, I took a, co a course a while ago where we had to visualize our caring committee and some of the benefactors <laughs> that I visualized today uh, were in that caring committee. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if it has any kind of like um, healing effect or, or in a way, I mean, the purpose of this course was somewhat to, um, I guess, uh, change our new neural circuits somehow. And uh, I guess trying to maybe heal trauma and see the, the good instead of focusing on the negative. Mm. But I mean, I, I'm just wondering what, uh, I mean, what do you have to say about like the yeah. effect of this practice? On us. Well, you're you're the you're the best scientist. Your own experience, <laughs> truly. No. <laughs> no, it's true, right? Like how we experience it and feel it, right? Like mm -hmm. that, and um, you know, placebo effect. Period is such great evidence that our mind can heal itself, right? Like we know that, you know, placebo effect is so powerful. Even when you know it's placebo, it still helps. And, and not just, you know, with so-called squishy psychological issues, but like physical um, level issues. And then, you know, I think it's interesting um, in the world, one of the worlds where I'm walking of psychology, we, we often get a little too stuck on um, suppressing what feels bad, increasing what feels good. Mm -hmm. And we forget the wider view, you know, equanimity, which we talked about last week. You know, how do we really have a sense that good, bad, like, okay, like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not that we want bad, but that we aren't right. so caught in our craving and aversion. And so I think, I think the benefactor practice can, can help us because it can help us kind of soften and feel nourished, but that's not the purpose. In a way, the purpose is still to find that equanimity. You know, but it's hard to connect with equanimity if we aren't able to sense ourselves as a truly reliable, like the inner forging, the inner okayness at such a deep level. So I wouldn't want us to just use the practice. It's great that it helps us feel better and probably does help our trauma symptoms. But like what really helps and this it really annoys me that this is true, but I feel it to be true um, that like. You know, the best way for us to address like our difficult emotional experiences throughout the lifetime is for them to like self liberate, right? To have enough space and to be able to hold them in that view of equanimity. Mm -hmm. And until then, because we live in relative reality, it's going to be whack a mole. Like, let's, <laughs> let's address the hard <laughs> things that come up and let's plant the nice seeds and have those come up. But like, we got to keep in mind the bigger view or else we're just chasing, you know? So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's really wonderful questions um, and reflections. Any, anyone else? Yeah, please. I think I found it a little bit, it was like a mixed emotions because mm. at least the first two or three benefactors I thought of are like people that aren't with me anymore. Yeah. And then it's, it's a off, like it's like acknowledging the beauty and what they sh showed you or something but that their absence yeah especially exiting the practice yeah yeah it's kind of like yeah it's like positive in a painful way yeah C can i ask you like and how is that i think it's still net positive probably. yeah yeah but, yeah yeah yeah, I had the same. I had, for some reason, in this time of this practice, it was like all these folks who aren't here anymore. And uh, there is a little bit of that heaviness of missing them, but also that like, for sure, they're still here, right? And in not in a metaphysical way, maybe that's true too, but like, you know, they forged this being, um, which feels really, really good. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So... The um, 
let's catch up with, with, with Buddha here. So he, um, as some of you may remember, he just met these brothers, the Kasapa brothers, who were all worshiping fire and had this just incredible set of discussions with one of the brothers around interdependence and dependent co-origination and why and like really was inviting him over and over keep looking deeper is fire really the essence of all things is any one thing the essence of all things and when the the Kasapa brother kind of had his realization um he just saw like no no one thing can be everything he saw the truth of interdependence and it's interesting to me again in rereading this book for like the fourth or fifth time I think I like when I wasn't teaching it I just like gloss over the parts I've heard before I'm like oh yeah dependent consideration again 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 in this chapter but it's so important and powerful and interesting I think it was also so different than what many of the spiritual teachers at the time were focusing on right and many folks here might have grown up in different theistic traditions and you know maybe there was a belief like yeah there's like you know there's Jesus or Allah or someone out there. And like, that's who matters. And it's all about them. And to like bust out of a paradigm and really see the interdependence. Um, it's beautiful. And in the reading we did last week, it was all about this, how believing in kind of any one thing makes us have such strong craving and aversion. We want something. We don't want something. Um, and the kind of culmination of the, this Buddha's teaching, this fire sutra last week is he has 900 new initiates and decides to um, stay for three months with, with these initiates and really help them learn. Um, and um, let's go see if there's anything. Yeah. We're on chapter 28. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, as we move into the next chapter, it, it's interesting. Um, it really gets like Buddha starting to make his way towards his homeland. He hasn't been home in seven years, but along the way, he's kind of visiting folks he met on the journey. And some of you may remember maybe 10 chapters back, he met a young King in the forest, King Bimbasara. And this king met Buddha, who wasn't awakened yet, but was well on his way, kind of an impressive guy at the time, looked like he was dedicated and caring, already had a lot of teachings. And the king, you know, begged Buddha, like, please stay here. I'll give you a house that you can um, have everything you need. And, you know, the Buddha had to say, like, I, I so appreciate it, but that's not what I'm seeking. Like, I'm seeking true liberation. And the king said, promise me you'll come back when you find it. And Buddha keeps his word. So he's like, I'm going to um, head back and to Rajagaha. And the this newly formed Sangha of 900 bhikkhus and the Kasapa brothers are like, let's go with you. And he's like, yeah, I'm traveling light and you guys can stay. Um, but he's convinced that he should bring all the 900 bhikkhus with him, partially because way, where they've all congregated, they can't support. There's not enough community there to support uh, the everyday begging of almost a thousand bhikkhus. So they slowly make their way to this larger city and they went into a beautiful palm forest living in the forest. And I want to read just this passage about how the bhikkhus go out every day to, to get their food. Something about it just so beautiful again in this humility of just receiving. Um, the next morning, the bhikkhus took their bowls and went begging in the city. They walked single file in their small groups, taking calm, slow steps. They held their bowls serenely while their eyes looked straight ahead. Following the Buddha's instruction, they stood before each house without discriminating whether it belonged to rich or poor. If no one appeared after a few moments, they moved on to the next house. While silently waiting for food offerings to be made, they mindfully observed their breath. 
When they received a food offering, they bowed in thanks. They never made any comments about whether the food looked good or bad. Sometimes the lay person making the offering asked the bhikkhu a few questions about the Dharma, and the bhikkhu answered thoughtfully to the best of his ability. The bhikkhu explained that he belonged to the Sangha of Gautama, the Buddha, and he would speak about the four noble truths and the five precepts for the laity and the eight noble path, eightfold path. The bhikkhus always returned to Palm Forest by noon to share their meal in silence before listening to discourse on the Dharma. Afternoons and evenings were reserved for meditation practice. Thus, after the noon hour, no one in the city saw the bhikkhus. So just, yeah, it's interesting to just try to imagine like a thousand monks in these beautiful robes coming into the city every morning. And just in this, like in the very way that they enter the city and are asking for support, it kind of inspires the people of the city. So after only a couple of days of the bhikkhus being there, people start showing up in the forest and like looking for the Buddha and listening to his teachings in the afternoons. And before Buddha has time to go seek out his friend, the king, Bimbasara, the king finds out he's there and is certain that it's this young monk he met in the forest. And just to keep it, you know, low pro, he brings a thousand of his friends. It's funny, like, my, I keep wondering, I'm like, how did everybody hear the Buddha? Like, you know, like, how, anyway, like, they didn't have microphones. Did they use the, like, one person shouts at the next? Uh, anyway, that's just some of my, my questions. Um, so it said, uh, 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 the Buddha, this is just one of the afternoons, the afternoon that the king came with his a thousand people. The Buddha spoke about the way of awakening. He spoke about the impermanent and interdependent nature of all things in life. He said that the path of awakening could help one overcome false views and transcend suffering. He spoke about how observing precepts could help one attain concentration and understanding. His voice resounded like a great bell. It was warm as spring sunshine, gentle as light rain, and majestic as the rising tide. More than 1,000 people listened. No one dared breathe too loudly to, or rustle their robes for fear of disturbing the sound of the Buddha's wondrous voice. King Bimbisara's eyes grew, br grew brighter by the moment. The more he listened, the more his heart felt open. So many of his doubts and troubles vanished. A radiant smile appeared on his face. When the Buddha concluded his Dharma talk, the king stood up and joined his palms. He said, from the time I was young, I've had five wishes. I have now fulfilled them all. The first was to receive coronation and become a king. That has been fulfilled. The second was to meet in this very life an enlightened teacher. That has also been fulfilled. The third was to have a chance to show respect to such a teacher. That wish has now been fulfilled. The fourth was to have such a teacher show me the true path. That has now been fulfilled. And the fifth was to be able to understand the teaching of the enlightened one. Master, this wish has just been fulfilled. Your wondrous teaching has brought so much understanding. Please accept me as your lay disciple. So just like, just so, so beautiful. Um, like not only the description of what the Buddha's voice sounded like, but also, you know, people encountering the teachings and just like instantly having this understanding and clarity. Um, and uh, the king then decides to invite the whole retinue, 900 bhikkhus over for dinner. It's a lot of plates. Like I have like eight plates. Um, I have more cutlery, but still like 900 um, so just this starting this relationship with, with the benefactors too. Um, the king goes on to gift Buddha a whole forest, um, where he starts doing a retreat in the rainy season. Um, and it's a really, it's like a mutual benefit, right? By offering the forest to the Buddha, he knows that the teachings will be near him. And it's this interesting thing. If I think about the benefactors who came up for me in this practice, all, all of them were elders who I met at a young time in my life, maybe inspired by you, Jimmy, of like, you know, these elders we meet and who are kind to us without reason. <clears throat> and um, I, am, I have never really thought about like, what, what was it doing for them? What was like the benefit also for them to be able to just show kindness to a little rapscallion like yourself or like me, you know? 
running around unruly and um yeah just this interesting again relationship of interdependence nothing is going just one way um <clears throat> so as is as is often the way with the buddha um throughout the following me- weeks many seekers came to the buddha and asked to be ordained many of them were highly educated young men from men from wealthy families the buddha senior students before Form the ordination ceremonies and gave them basic instructions. And then um, Kandana, who's one of the you know, senior um, students, who was one of those first five students of the Buddha, he gave three refuges to a gathering of nearly 300 young people. And he spoke to them about the precious gems, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And I know you um, covered these a bit when Tig was here and talked about refuge, but just such a beautiful uh, reminder of the three gems that I want to share here tonight. So the Buddha, the first gem, is the awakened one. An awakened person sees the nature of life and the cosmos. Because of that, an awakened person is not bound by illusion, fear, anger, or desire. An awakened person is a free person filled with peace, joy, love, and understanding. Our teacher is a completely awakened person. He shows us the way in this life so we may overcome forgetfulness and become awakened ourselves. Every one of us contains Buddha nature. We can all become a Buddha. Buddha nature is the capacity to awaken and transcend all ignorance. I I really love that. So taking refuge in the Buddha is not just believing that there was this historical guy who whose voice resounded like a clear bell in a mountain spring or right. It's this belief that that Buddha nature is in us. He wasn't just some exceptional being. He represented what all of us have. So when we take refuge in or think about, you know, these three gems, the Buddha is our own Buddha nature as well. The Dharma is the path which leads to awakening. It is the path which the Buddha teaches, the path which helps us to transcend the prisons of ignorance, anger, fear, and desire. This path leads to freedom, peace, and joy. It enables us to love and understand others. Understanding and love are the two most beautiful fruits of the path of awakening. The Dharma is the second precious gem. And I love this part that the Dharma or the teachings enables us to love and understand all others. And that this understanding and love are the two most beautiful fruits of our, of the path, you know, just that we can really have empathy and care for all beings and not just because all beings deserve it, but because of how much freer we are and we're not bound up by judgment. Right. Um, Yeah. And I think it's interesting People use the word Dharma a lot to describe a lot of things. And, and actually your, your uh, reflection earlier, where you're saying the people you learned from, right? Like possibly, you know, your Dharma teachers, right? These impossibly diff- difficult people. Um, and just curious from folks when they hear that word, like, what does it mean? Here it says, it is the teachings and the path to awakening. But people use it in so many contexts. Any other thoughts on that word the dharma what does it mean to you other than the collective here i was a little confused by from the last chapter of the fire chapter, because he says all dharmas are on fire and he goes through and talks about that and i was you know i mean i was trying to think about it i thought i reflected on the idea that that suffering all of the sense suffering and all of that that that's the teaching that that's the pathway there and so, because I'm used to thinking about the Dharma. Wholesome. Yeah, yeah. Wholesome sort of thing. And then you say, it's on fire. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting as you also hear people say, um, like, whatever is going on in your life that's hard, like, that's your Dharma. Yeah. Right. And then it gets confusing. Like, do you mean it's my karma? Like, yeah. they like sound the same. Right. There's. Um, but I, I think you're right. Like all dharmas are on fire as in like, can we, can we learn from all these different experiences? Like we really like everything can be our dharma, right? Um, if we learn from it, if we can use it as our path of awakening, just, you know, it's a little broad. So that's why. So yeah, thanks for the question. Um, anyone else on that term? Yeah. 
My understanding also was that Dharma was kind of a placeholder word to mean phenomena. Hmm. So in that sense, it's pretty literal, like yeah. all Dharma is being all things. Mm-hmm. It's too bad we use the same word for the same yeah, thing. It's, <laughs> it's a nice sounding word. Yes. Uh, you might need to repeat this. Ruth yeah. King offers, I shared this with you here, Buddha Dharma Sangha is awareness, truth. So Dharma being truth. And Sangha being love. Mm. So Ruth King, uh, some of you may know her as an author. She offers Buddha Dharma Sangha as awareness, truth, love, uh, love. I like that. So, yes. So I find you. Yeah. So that might actually be for Ken. So maybe Ken might try to find the Dharma. Hmm. So right now it's in the medical book that I'm in front of. So that I'm not aware of the ultimate material of your mind. That's called the Dharma. The ego in the previous book is pretty much a summer of the mind. So that's that's not that it's clarity. Yes. The reality of the emptiness of the call of Dharma. So the Dharma Yes. Mm, beautiful. Oh my goodness. Did you guys hear that? I might need you to use the mic on that. I'm there's no way I'm gonna do that justice. <laughs> that was so beautiful. Okay. You can do abbreviate if you want, no problem. Okay. So uh Came from uh, just like Dharma, it's actually a Sanskrit word. It means, uh, so when it translated into Tibetan, it's called Che. Che means uh, kind of like taming your mind. So that when you talk about the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha over there, it's similar, like the reality, the nature of the mind, hmm. emptiness, or like what you call the primordial nature. On top of that, it's called the nature reality, it's called empty. Hmm. So that the Dharma, uh, means for the transforming your mind. So as a, as a being a, in a real, uh, just like a common people, we have lots of uh, things like afflictions, whatever we have. So timing that is called Dharma. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that, that the training and the um, getting ourselves really clear on what it is the Dharma is leading to, I think is also that can help us and what we're identifying because I don't think it helps to get too broad in general. And then we could maybe lose track of like, what is the purpose? Like, what is this leading towards? But I think in these um, three precious gems, one of the things that really sticks out to me is we can't have just one. Like we could have an amazing teacher truly enlightened one. We should be so lucky. But if we are not also training our own mind, right? And I, I've met so many people over the years and I, I totally respect it, but I meet so many people who they have the books, the most amazing books you could imagine. No teacher, no sangha. And I don't think you can actually get through or kind of make as much progress if you're not also engaging the teacher and, and the community. Um, so the Sangha is the community of persons practicing the way of awakening, those who travel this path together. If you have a community to practice with, oh, sorry, if you want to practice the way of liberation, it is important to have a community to practice with. If you're all alone, difficulties along the path may hinder your realization of awakening. It's important to take refuge in the Sangha. Whether you're an ordained bhikkhu or a lay person, the Sangha is the third precious gem. And I think, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, I've heard so many different reasons why potentially practicing together may help. In some contexts, it's said that it brings more merit to our practice. Like our practice is actually enhanced in its benefit when we practice with others. And also, you know, practicing together makes us feel like less alone. This is, it was as I haven't mentioned capitalism in a while, so I'll mention it here. Once again, it's so hard to be against the stream, right? And to have a value system that is driving like 
at a core level, your perception of the world that's against um, capitalism. And so to have a sense of not alone and together, it's so beautiful. And to be able to feel and recognize, yeah, other people are experiencing this too. And to hear about people's experiences, their challenges, it's just, I have no idea how we could do this on our own. Um, you know, it's, it's really, yeah, it's really beautiful. And then when we have even closer relationships, maybe just with one person, our Kalyana Mitra, our spiritual friends, it's really good. They like engage us. They, you know, we can have like healthy competition, like, oh, they're practicing an hour at night. Okay. Yeah. I could up my game too. Like there's so, it's like really helpful to have people that we are closing, uh, tracking really closely with on our practice. Um, so with that, let's dedicate our merit here together. Taking a moment and reconnecting to the breath and the body. And feeling a sense of that love that we may have touched into earlier. That sense of care and kindness that truly is within us. And it's from that place of a deep knowing of our own love and capacity that we can open our heart and extend this love. There are so many, many, many places in this world, in this moment where people are suffering. And to hold a sense of our deep care and an aspiration that what we are doing here together in any way, shape, or form could radiate out in the greatest hopes that all beings could be healthy and strong, that all beings would know safety and belonging, that all beings could be free. Thank you so much for being here in person and online. Please support what you can. Oh, thanks for that heart. That's so cool. Thanks. Uh, support what you can uh, to keep our beautiful Sangha going here um, with the Dharma Collective. We have some cool stuff coming up this weekend. Very cool stuff.